values make the determinant zero? Let me go. Let me let me let me go back to basics here for a minute. Okay. Here's a here's a better one. I mean, I I, so I wanted to show you an example in here before I put this away, and then I'll go back to the the basics. So here here's a symmetric matrix actually, right? And through the calculation, which I will explain shortly, you look at the determinant of a minus lambda i, which is the characteristic equation. When you do that, you get zero, minus one, and three. You know, and um, then you calculate the eigenvectors. They happen to be 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, minus 1, and 0, 1, 1. I can choose those to be length 1 and to be orthonormal because this is a symmetric matrix and we know the real spectral theorem we proved earlier makes it so. The real spectral theorem didn't tell us how to find those vectors, right? It just told, them, told us that they existed. But you, I mean, once you know that they're there, you can find them. The, the larger point here, though, is um, this matrix A, it's not you know, it's not super nice, but if you do a similarity transformation with respect to the change of basis, right? So I'm, I'm, I'm packaging it between, um, you see those, the, the, the eigenbasis, and then the eigenbasis over here. So it's actually P, A, P, I think. I don't, it's P transpose A, P is, is what you have here. And um, the transpose is the inverse, it's, a, it's an orthogonal matrix. And you see what happens when you do this matrix multiplication, you get to this. So what, what that says is that if you use coordinates which are based on the eigenvectors, the formula for the, you know, the original formula would have been something like Q of X, Y, Z equals to, you know, um, Y squared plus, um, yeah, four Y, Z, thanks, plus Z squared. If you look at it in terms of the eigencoordinates, the Q tilde of y1, y2, y3, in my current silly notation, the formula is just minus y2 squared um, plus 3y3 squared. So by, by finding the eigenvectors and changing coordinates to the eigen, you know, using eigen directions as your eigen, your, your, your coordinate system, the formula for the quadratic form becomes as simple as it can possibly come, become. Um, let's see if I so I have some better pictures. Here's another one. Here's a quadratic form: two x squared plus two xy plus two y squared. Um, if you find the eigenvalues, they're one and three. Those are the eigenvectors. 1, 1, and 1 minus 1, essentially. And here's a picture. So in the, in here, I actually, I have, in this example, I have all the details of the coordinate change. How do we get from eigenvalues to eigenvectors? Uh. So just to, just to, just, we just, again, basics. So if I have matrix A, if, if, if a v is equal to lambda v, for v not equal to zero, yeah. then um, uh, makes. <coughs> Repression and. V and eigenvector. Sort of an a of unwanted experience. Lambda, all right. That's the definition of both eigenvector and eigenvalue. Question is how do you find those, right? So if you look at this, you have a v equal to lambda v for v dot equal to zero, right? But that implies it's when I say a minus lambda i is v is equal to zero for v not equal to zero, right? <coughs> so the thing is. That says something very special about the matrix in parentheses, right? It says it's a matrix for which the zero solution has, 
I mean, the, you know, the homogeneous problem has a non-zero solution. So you notice v equals, I mean, if you, if you think about v as being a variable for a second here, if you put zero here, you get zero, right? But you also have that this is zero for some non-zero v, right? So there's at least two solutions. Oh, well, game over. There's infinitely many solutions. It's linear algebra, right? So what does that say about the determinant of this matrix? Yeah, right. So it's non-invertible. And so there you go. That's the so-called characteristic equation. So if it's a solution to the characteristic equation, then that makes it an eigenvalue. But we do insist that it, it, its solution has to lie in the field in which we're considering. So if we're working in the real field, then we have to have a real eigenvalue. So there, there are matrices which have no eigenvalues and no eigenvectors. For example, a rotation. If you look at the matrix cosine theta, sine theta, minus sine theta, cosine theta, right? And theta not equal to 0 or pi, or integer multiples thereof. In other words, if it's not plus or minus the identity. Think about what this equation means geometrically. It means that there's a fixed vector in the sense that the operation of the matrix times the vector is just giving you another vector which is collinear to the original vector. Well, if you have a rotation in the plane, think about it. And if this is R, well, RV is somewhere else, right? There's no constant. It's impossible to solve this equation. So there's no eigenvector to this matrix. So not every matrix has an eigenvector. I mean, and by the way, if you calculate the uh, the eigen the characteristic equation here, you get e to the i theta plus or minus i theta as the eigenvalues. In other words, it, it, it has complex eigenvalues: cosine plus or minus i sine theta. Um, Oh, anyway, without, <laughs> without reteaching all of linear algebra, let me stop. Uh, this goes on for about three weeks in linear algebra. I must stop. <laughs> OK. <laughs> There's more to say, obviously. Um, but So what I have here, guys, is just some pictures of, you know, here's a picture of the quadratic form x squared plus 2xy plus y squared, right? So x squared plus 2xy plus y squared, if you think about it, it's really just x plus y squared. So what that means is if you use x plus y as a coordinate, this is like coordinate squared equals to z. So it's just, it's just a cylinder, with, it's like a parabolic cylinder. It's just a parabola all the way down the trough. And if you calculate the eigenvalues and calculate the eigenvector, it explicitly shows you which coordinates you can use, these ones, x bar 1 half x minus y, y bar 1 half x plus y. Of course, the quadratic form equation becomes just, I think, 1 half y bar squared. Oh, I'm sorry, I can't do math. 2 y bar squared. Duh. And so you can see it. You can see it. Here's a picture of the quadratic form. You know, you can see it's just that trough which has been rotated 45 degrees. By the way, you know, what's the relation between the standard basis in Rn and an orthonormal basis? How do you obtain the orthonormal basis from the standard basis? How, you can always get it from rotating the standard basis by appropriate element of, of On. Might be disoriented. I can't say SON. So I know one of the very frustrating things for me in teaching linear is I can only tell half of the story over there. Here I'm showing you the other half. And if you're not super up to date on your linear and the eigenvalues and eigenvectors, do not despair. After you work a couple homework problems, this stuff is really not as awful as it seems, perhaps. Here's a, here's a fun Uber example. I have f of x comma y is 4 minus x minus 1 squared plus y minus 2 squared plus a times the exponential of that stuff plus 2b times
times that. And so my question is, if I choose different values of a and b, how does it make the point 1, 1, either a maximum, or well, excuse me, 1, 2, either a maximum, a minimum, or otherwise? And so what I do here is just calculate the Hessian. And so if you take my silly formula and you work it out, the Hessian you end up with is a plus 1 h squared plus 2 b h k plus a plus 1, which gives you this matrix. And then the question boils down to, what are the eigenvalues of this matrix with respect to different choices of a and b? And it turns out there's about five cases. Let's not look at them too carefully. There's probably an error in here. <laughs> but you see the idea of the problem. Yeah. Um, this is obviously not a test question. Good grief. But it's fun. The idea of the problem is fun. Here's some pictures for different choices of A and B. I actually have graphs of how you get minimums or maximums or saddles re reflecting of my choices. It's the little dimple <laughs> that you can't. <laughs> it's <laughs> there. <laughs> there. <laughs> Up in there. there. <laughs> Ah. So guys, that, that's the, I never actually wrote it down, but do you understand what the second derivative test is? What's that? We should write it down. Number one, uh, given a function from, say, Rn to R with nabla f at the point p equals to 0. Step two. So the starting point for the second derivative test is that you have a critical point. That much you must have, right? And then step two is you can calculate um, the, uh, the Hessian. Find its matrix. And so the, the matrix of the Hessian is, I mean, I know that the, quadri the, the um, look, guys, the, uh, the formula I wrote for the multivariate power series probably looks scary to you. But let me write down the matrix of the Hessians for 2 by 2. Once I show you that, you'll be like, oh, duh. Look at this. Here's the 2 by 2 Hessian. The 3 by 3 Hessian. Yeah. But by Clairaut's theorem, they're equal, which is why this is symmetric. So more, more generally, you know, the Hessian, the ijth component is just partial i, partial i, partial j of f. Well, no parentheses needed, the ijth component. So for a two by two, for a two by two, what are the eigenvalues of a two by two matrix? Do you guys know? Two by two matrix, what are the eigenvalues? How they're related to the matrix? The determinant of the matrix is the product of the eigenvalues. The trace of the matrix is the sum of the eigenvalues. So what's the determinant of this matrix? No, not 0. doesn't have to be. Do you recognize that expression? That's that D that you see in Calculus 3 books. Think about it. If the eigenvalues have the same sign and they're both positive, the determinant is what? Positive, which means it's a local minimum. If the eigenvalues are both negative, it's positive. But it's a local maximum. How do you tell the difference? It's based on this. 
it turns out that if the if the x derivative is positive, it's a it's a it's a um, minimum. If the x, x x derivative is negative, it's a maximum. And then if the determinant's negative, if the d is less than zero, that means these had opposite signs, which means that you have a saddle. And finally, when is the second derivative test silent? When the big D is 0, which corresponds to the eigenvalue, one or the other one of them being 0. Now, I can't write for you such a simple expression for the eigenvalues of a 3 by 3 matrix. That's why there is no nice second derivative test for functions of three variables. Because the, the eigenvalues for a 3 by 3 matrix, yeah, it's still the sum of the eigenvalues is a trace. The product of the eigenvalue is still the determinant. But you got three variables and two equations. You need another, you know. So there's no nice third, uh, second derivative test for three variables. You have to use linear algebra. But it's it's well understood. Linear algebra is not a big deal. Anyway, with that, I will shut up for today. I think. Oh, oh, one other thing. One other thing. One other thing. If you think about this, what we've done, you could go one up more step. If you're willing to give up on the orthonormal basis. Maybe even not. But you can basically take this and uh, take the matrix and take all the things which are, are, uh, are positive. You could rescale those to length 1. You could take all the things that are negative. You could rescale those to length minus 1 by, like, uh, by a dilation, I think, the appropriate kind of dilation matrix, sort of. And the things that are 0 could stay 0. You can basically find a change of basis which puts the quadratic form into the, into the special form 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, minus 1, minus 1, minus 1, minus 1, minus 1, and then some zeros. This result is known as Sylvester's theorem. It, it's, a, it's another like, sort of canonical form for a quadratic form that's especially useful for various questions of analysis. And of course, Sylvester is a good guy. He had a good first name. So anyways, with that, I will stop. Thanks, Lauren.